Okay, and the other thing is whoever's the host allow has to allow me to share screen. Okay. <clears throat> so is that up as well? I'll try it. Did my screen share? Yep. Yeah. You're yeah. Oh, we're good so far. Wow. Should be somewhere good. How's that? Nice and big? Good. Good. All right. Well, first, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I love talking about a whole variety of uh, radio topics, and I retired from uh, physics teaching in high school and college about 10 years ago, and I went back and tried to learn a lot of the stuff about ham radio <laughs> that I never really understood. Um, so I had the time, I had a lot of books, talked to a lot of people, watched a lot of YouTubes, and you know it was fun for me to pick up stuff that uh, I just kind of skipped over. I never really bothered to learn much about Winlink, uh, and I wasn't too much into emergency communications. But up here in Chester County, Pennsylvania, there's a pretty active Aries Racies group, and that forced me to learn a lot of this stuff. So I thought, let me talk a little bit about emergency communications in general, uh, and then kind of narrow in on the concept of a sound card mode called VARA, because uh, it's all kind of new. So what is it different about emergency communications compared to just, you know, chatting or contest or de-expeditions? What's the most important thing about emergency communications? Um, if you were my class, I would pause and say contribute, but I guess it's going to be chaotic if I try to run it like a, uh, like a class. So I think the most important thing is accuracy, 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 and maybe to some extent speed if you've got to send long messages. So how do you get accuracy? Well, I wouldn't pick up a microphone and start talking phonetically. Uh, we try that, we practice it, but that's hard to do. And it's how fast can you talk? How many words per minute? So we wouldn't send messages out in uh, Chester County when we have a shelter and try to translate stuff into a, you know, a voice on two meter. Plus everyone's listening who wants to, and some of the stuff you might think is a little more private. So what else is next? CW. Well, I love to work CW. I learned CW as a 12-year-old kid. I can copy about 25 words per minute in my head, but I wouldn't trust it for emergency communications. I learned to listen for a QSO, and I can pick up name, QTH, age, you know, maybe job. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, when it comes to emergency communication, I wouldn't trust my CW copy. Plus, I can't write as fast as I can hear here in my head. So what else? Well, you know, in the 1980s or so, there was a lot of packet. I got involved with uh, packet on two meters and joined these bulletin boards. And I realized after about five years, I hate listening to packet. I, I'm a bassoon and saxophone player. And, you know, like to, that's an annoying sound to listen to packet. So my enthusiasm for packet sort of waned as the Internet got a lot better. And you could get a lot farther, you know, on uh, some, uh, you know, provider on a internet connection. Um, I've done a lot of emergency communications from my truck, and I like this uh, uh, illustration <laughs> just because I spent a lot of time in my pickup truck, and uh, with a couple of different radios and a variety of antennas, I could get on two meters and four forty, you know, like all the other mobiles and work pretty reliably stations within you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 miles, uh, working through a repeater, maybe a little farther. Uh, if I put on a 10 meter whip on top of my cap, just a little uh, hamstick or a hustler, I can sometimes hear Europe. Uh, I put on 20 meters, I can almost during the daytime talk to anywhere a thousand miles away if 20 meters is open. 80 meters, that's tough to do mobile, so I throw a 100-foot wire, 100 wire into a tree and run it as an NFED, and I can talk to anyone within uh, 500 miles of my truck. So I found with a kind of an all-mode, uh, you know, small 50-watt radio with a variety of antennas, I'm good on almost any HF band, 80 through 70 centimeters. But, uh, you know, it's a little uncomfortable to sit in your truck and try to copy uh, traffic. All right, so let's get on with the slideshow, and we'll try to do justice to this. So the popular modes for emergency communication, well, there's a, there's a whole lot of different modes that are actively used. 
On the HF bands on 80 and 40 meters, uh, the dominant mode is probably Olivia because it's so robust. If I listen, uh, even right now, around 35, 83, I'll start to hear the Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee uh, nets. Uh, MFSK is great for um, sending traffic a little faster than Olivia, but it's a multi-tone, dee 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 uh, very, very strong forward air correction, so the accuracy is superb, as long as someone's not on your frequency and, you know, QR, I mean. My favorite mode on 80 meters in the morning is Thor. Uh, Thor is like a beautiful sound to a bassoon player. Uh, 18 tones, it's only one at a time. They never have two tones at once or you'd splatter all over the band. 18 tones, and Thor uses the incremental difference between pitch, that's the characters. So it's not the absolute pitch, da, da, da. It's the, it's the pitch change that determines the, uh, you know, the bits. Um, you hear a lot on two meters of MT-63, another annoying sound, but very, very robust. Uh, MT-63 uh, sort of sounds like rain hitting a roof. It's not musical at all, but it works very reliably with a lot of noise on the channel. And once I was stationed at Paoli Hospital up here in Pennsylvania, and I was sending a message uh, about shel shelters, but using acoustic coupling, which is absolutely awful. So I held my radio's microphone next to my computer speaker, and I was sending a short message with the uh, MT-63 mode. So I'm behind the hospital, and I'm not too far from the emergency room, and an ambulance pulls in with the siren going in the middle of my transmission. I'm thinking, oh, should I stop? This is awful. It's so loud. You know, sirens going. Uh, and I wasn't in the way, but I thought this sound is going to kill my transmission, but I let it go. And after I finished, I turned it over, I actually picked up the microphone to say, did you copy that? Because an ambulance just went by me with the sirens blurry. And the guy at the other end uh, over at the Chester County EOC said, copied it fine. So a blaring ambulance siren did not obliterate the MT-63 signal. Interesting. They're much faster modes, uh, 8PSK, OFDM, VARA, we'll get to VARA, and PACTOR. So these are the dominant modes that I hear for um, emergency communication purposes. There's no single best mode. Depends on what band you are, the noise, a lot of things. Some are faster, some are slower. Olivia is very slow, like 30 words a minute. And OFDM modes can be 3,000 words a minute. That's the range, all within the spectrum of a human voice, 500 hertz to 3,000 hertz, same as a, you know, a phone. So uh, this Winlink is just superb for you know, what its function was, and it's been around for a while. On the HF bands, uh, I'm going to be on 80 meters tonight as a demo, uh, the dominant mode is probably Pactor for emergency purposes. But Pactor, as I'll show you, requires a special uh, machine called a terminal node controller, a TNC, that generates the sounds. Uh, Pactor isn't too successful in Windows machines. Plus, the authors and the uh, creator of Pactor decided not to license the software to other technologies. So if you operate Pactor, you do it with a, a specific kind of TNC that costs about a thousand bucks. Vira, on the other hand, can work with any sound card. In fact, where did I put it? If you look at my little picture, I can operate Vira with a $5 USB, you know, plug-in sound card. This is as cheap as you get, as simple as you get, and I've tried it. Works okay on Vira. Um, it's not like it has to reproduce, you know, symphonic music. Uh, even the Vira sounds are pretty easy to generate in a simple TNC. There's some other modes that are on the way out, RDOP, Winmore, um, and I still hear a little bit of packet, but you don't hear packet on HF bands. On VHF, UHF, of course, packet's still around, but VAR is quickly replacing packet. It's far more robust. I would say um, maybe this isn't a fair comparison. VAR is like a 20-speed bicycle, and packet's like a one-speed Schwinn. <laughs> All right, some people are laughing. It's actually pretty close to that, but there are a lot of packet enthusiasts who would clobber me for saying that. I don't even okay. say a cough, cough. Yeah, okay. All right. 
So uh, WinLink, well, um, I started this about five, six, seven years ago, maybe. So you have to go down the WinLink org website, register your call so you're official. They don't charge you, but they keep bugging you to send them money. So I forget what that's, what's that called, Nagware? Uh, but you don't have to pay for it. So K3 EUI is registered and you register online. Now you can give them other information uh, just to say you first to use WinLink, you've got to register your call. And when I did, they wrote back to me within 24 hours and said, oh, thank you, blah, blah, blah. Here's some suggestions. They suggested I watch some YouTube videos to see how it works. It was really pretty easy. Then when I wanted to hook up um, uh, uh, VARA, a specific mode of WinLink, uh, you've got to go through some configurations. <laughs> the pain of all the digital modes is configure your computer to your radio and or your computer to your sound card. So you've got to have some sort of a sound card to do uh, VARA. It's sound card related. It's not a, like a TNC. So once you tell it who your uh, microphone input and your speaker output, microphone inputs the receive audio, speaker output is your transmit audio, and how do you want to PTT? This is usually the critical part. How when the software says to your radio, okay, transmit, how does that accomplish that? And there are a whole bunch of ways you can do that. Uh, a simple one is just use the radio's Vox, but that's kind of uh, a last resort. Uh, you can use rig control of some kind, and every rig is unique, and some rigs are so old you can't do rig control. So often even the old rigs have a data port, and if you ground the PTT pin, you're on the air. So a simple way to do this is to get some sort of, sort of a circuit that your computer program sends a positive voltage on either the RTS or the DTR pin of a COM port, real or virtual, and your radio interprets it that as you want to transmit, and it closes the transmit switch and you're on. And there's some other techniques too. There's some new uh, sound cards uh, coming out of uh, mostly master's communication called DRA. And they have a completely different way of uh, tripping the PTT line. Um, and I find that's really easy. That's probably the best. So you've got to configure your software to your radio and your sound card. So let's take a look at WinLink Express. This is a, an old version here, but basically WinLink can, if you want to open a session and pick, well, how do you want the software to work? So there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Telnet just means if you have a, uh, um, a network connection to the internet, just use that. You don't need a radio at all. It's kind of boring. Uh, but you can do packet, pack tour, whole bunch of different modes here, VARA HF, WinLink and VARA FM. The VARA FM is a different modem. They're made by the same company, the same person, but the VARA FM modem is designed for the FM bands like two meters, 70 centimeters. VARA HF obviously designed for a single sideband radio on the HF band, so they operate a little differently. There's also something you can do that says, well, if I don't wanna to talk to a gateway and get on the internet, what if I just wanna to talk to another ham? forget the gateway and the internet. I just want to converse with another ham and send them an email, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to demonstrate that tonight. That's called peer to peer, P2P. So that means you're sending an email back and forth, but you're not trying to get it out on the internet to someone or somewhere else. So there's a whole bunch of different modes within the WinLink program. So I'll show you how I'm going to do it, and then we'll actually do it. And then we can talk about why this is a pretty effective method. So I start out a new message. I tell Win like, all right, I want to send a message to somebody. First thing I decide is, how do I want to send it as a WinLink message? That can only go to a gateway. Gateways are specifically designed, approved by the WinLink organization. And they're kind of dedicated and stay on one frequency, on either 2 meters, 440, HF. Now, it's not like they own the frequency, but they advertise they're always listening on this frequency. So I was tempted to do that tonight, but it would be, you know, too iffy. Maybe I wouldn't get a good contact or contact at all. Uh, so these things called gateways are WinLink related radios and Internet connections that once a message gets to a gateway, it then can go out on the normal Internet anywhere in the world. What if I just want to get another mortal ham who's not you know, a gateway? Then you do peer-to-peer -peer or radio-only message. So 
I have to say, who do I want to send the message to? So I'm not sending this message tonight, but NY3J is a good buddy up in Ben Salem. Uh, I'm send a carbon copy to myself, and I'm going to test sending an American Red Cross daily shelter report. So here I make out a message. I click post to the out box, so I put this message in my ready to send box. Here's some other things that make WinLink so successful. There are forms that are already made up by the WinLink organization, and these forms can just be filled in with data, and I send to the sending, uh, to the receiving station, hey, I'm gonna send you an American Red Cross daily shelter report, get ready. And what I do is just send the data. The receiving station already knows what this data is for, so if the receiving station gets the data, the receiving station puts the data into their form, which is the same as mine, and then displays it, and you can print it, do anything you want. So here's the beauty of WinLink. There's a whole bunch of pre-formatted messages, especially emergency messages from FEMA, PEMA, you know, uh, even an ARRL radiogram, uh, American Red Cross forms. All these are already part of the WinLink system. So when I want to send the message, I just send the data and what form I want to fill out. So it's very efficient. <laughs> Assuming the other person has these forms, if they don't have the forms, then they can't obviously open the message. So here's an example, and I'm going to send one of these tonight. Uh, Stephen, KC3DSO, is going to be on 80 meters with me, and we just tried this a minute ago, and it'll probably work, but I wouldn't guarantee it. So the American Red Cross has a form that we use a lot out here in Chester County, Pennsylvania, called the Daily Shelter Report. So in emergencies, if we open shelters, we had a big ice storm about five, six years ago, and we had three shelters open in the county, and all the shelters had a ham radio operator, radio, blah, 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 and each shelter had about 50 to 100 people who uh, they lost power, their homes were flooded, whatever the reason, they come to these shelters. And we as the hams would send back to W3EOC, ham radio station, one of these American Red Cross daily shelter reports a couple times a day. So here's the report, and it's not that I want you to be able to read all this, but it's a kind of a standard form that the American Red Cross made up, and we fill in the details here, the numbers. Who's the shelter manager? Who's the shift supervisor? Uh, what are the numbers of workers we have? What are the numbers in the shelter population, various ages? So uh, what do we need? Blankets, breakfast, lunch, you know, it's a long form. But essentially, we fill that out. I load it into a email and send it back to another radio station as a win link message with this attachment. They get it, they open it, they print it, they hand it to the, um, the manager in the W3EOC or the 911 room. Said, here's a message from, uh, you know, blah, 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 Downingtown High School Shelter. I just got it five minutes ago, here's the latest. So that's much more convenient for us as hams than me reading, you know, a whole bunch of words and names and things on a microphone. Um, so that's the basis for WinLink. It's a one-to-one -one link. Once I make the link with another station, or they make a link to me, uh, we're in handshaking mode, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So as I'm sending data, if I send a block of data, one kilobyte of data, and the receiving station for some reason doesn't get it, at the end of the one block, I go back to receive and the sending station says, nope, I didn't get it, send that block again. And we go again. So it's back and forth, so it's 100% accuracy as long as I can keep sending the data, sending the data until finally the receiving station says, I got it all, good, thank you, stop. <laughs> end, end of contact, we, you know. So that's how it usually works and it works very well. It's a one-to-one. -one. If I wanna send a message to 10 stations at once, this isn't the way to do it. Now, if I send a message to a gateway and they put it on the internet, then that's a way to do it. But the way we set it up in Chester County, we try to make it so that we don't need or require the general internet, because if that went down, we'd be sort of lost. So that's my introduction to how this WinLink is gonna work in my local county up here in Pennsylvania. Here's another one, we use these all the time, severe weather reports. So I'm usually sending these into one single station who's collecting all these from all over the county. Now, you know, um, we have individual weather stations that are pretty uh, sophisticated. 
and we have them in our own, you know, homes, QTHs, but we're scattered all over Chester County. And there's about, I think now about 20 or 30 of these. So during a snowstorm, an ice storm, whatever, we can automatically send these weather reports back in to a central station who can collect these and sort of see in the county where, where are their problems. Uh, we can also do it on uh, APRS. That's another way we can do this. So WinLink is still a, a very nice, clever method of sending emergency communications. So that's basically what it is. The WinLink modes, WinMore and RDOP are really the old ones from five, 10 years ago. Um, this is kind of a, a dated uh, slide here that I picked off, but uh, essentially it depends on the quality of the sound going into your transceiver as to what is going to transpire next. Pactor, Pactor 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, these are very, very sophisticated uh, modems, TNCs, and I'll show you some pictures of some, but this is an investment of a couple thousand dollars. Vara, it just needs a simple sound card. Um, now, to use it successfully, you need to buy the license, and I think at the moment, a license for your call for Vara is about $70, or maybe 50 if you're part of a club, something like that. So on single sideband, the VARA gateways, now the gateways, remember, are stations, ham radio stations that say, we're going to monitor our frequency 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week. We're always listening. It's not that we own that frequency, but that's where we're listening if you want to contact us. So on the uh, sideband bands, the HF bands, at this time of day when I clicked on this, uh, update who I might connect to from... I'm about 10 miles north of Wilmington. These are all the ham radio calls. They're on 80 meters. Here's 40 meters. Here's 60 meters. I wouldn't want to try that. Another 60 meters, 40. You see most of these. Uh, here's one on 160 meters. So they're operating on the mode Vera 2300, meaning their bandwidth, 2300 hertz. That's like the high speed, but that's pretty wide. Uh, a lot of these stations operate at 500 hertz maximum bandwidth. That's friendly because that means you're taking up about as much space as some of the other digital modes. And even CW is a couple hundred hertz. So if I want to try to connect to this person, I click on it and my software talks to my radio. If it's working, <laughs> switches my radio to that band, that frequency, and sets me up to transmit. The only thing I might have to do is press a, an antenna tuner button or check that I have the right antenna. And then I call this person on this frequency and maybe they answer, maybe they don't, or maybe before I call, I'm listening and hearing, oh, someone else is on the frequency. So since I'm a thoughtful operator, I won't try to connect until I hear the frequency is open or available. But if I move off this frequency, 3591.7, this station isn't going to hear me. This guy's permanently you know, sitting on this frequency, home or not. So this is the VARA gateways, and you see they're all over the country here. How about Pactor? Well, it works the same way, except these stations say their radio is set up for Pactor, not for VARA. So they're on a different set of frequencies. And in fact, I know W3JY very well. And he's on 80, 40, 20. And he says, I can do Pactor 3, Pactor 2, Pactor 1. Well, nobody does Pactor 1 anymore. That's 30 year old technology. Pactor 3 is still the fastest mode legal in the US. And that's pretty darn fast. But again, you need some pretty fancy equipments to do that. So if my station can do Pactor and I click on someone else who can do Pactor, we can get a Pactor link on a frequency and it should work very well if there's propagation. This particular channel selector software tells me all these stations I have a pretty good chance of getting, you know, when I pulled up this slide, 99%. Yeah, I can almost see W3JY from my window. It's, he's about 10 miles away, so that's easy. Uh, but some of the more distant stations, if I were to scroll down here, you'd see stations farther away that are 50-50. And once you get less than a 50% probability, I, I wouldn't even try. So Pactor on HF, all kinds of frequencies, bands. Local, well, I, from what I've heard, you guys do a lot of local, you know, 2 meter, 440. So uh, a lot of the local stuff tends to be packet. Just normal 1200 baud, you know, plain old packet. Um, what's wrong with packet? Anything? It's been Nothing. around for 40 years. Nothing. 
Um, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, but it's sort of like it. it's sort of like a one-speed bike. Uh, if it'll work, it'll work, and it'll work well. Uh, you might get some interference on a frequency. Um, I gave up all my packet TNCs about 20 years ago. I just gave them away because I just got tired of it. And then, you know, now I wish I had them back. But uh, packet works. It's a very simple technology. You know, the TNCs are not too expensive. And there's a software TNC that works, I think, better than most of the hardware TNCs. Uh, and it's free. <laughs> All right, so there's also this thing called Vara FM. FM. Well, it means it's designed for an FM radio. Now, remember, Vara is just sound, <laughs> uh, but the sound behaves a little differently on an FM radio where you don't have to tune it in so critically. You can mistune a single sideband radio and your voice starts to go up or down, 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 you know. So the Vara on HF has to first negotiate the pitch. So it does that. On FM, you don't have to bother with that. So the sound card pitches are kind of predetermined. So look at this. So from where I am in Westchester, I can connect to all these different stations on Vera Wide or Vera Narrow. What's the difference? Vera Narrow is kind of limited the bandwidth to a, what a human voice would be, uh, maybe two and a half kilohertz. You could even do this on a voice repeater, and we do sometimes with the repeater owner's permission. Uh, Vara works very well in the narrow mode on an analog voice repeater because it behaves sort of like a human voice. Vara wide, however, needs almost six kilohertz of bandwidth, meaning there's a lot more sound, it's a lot more complicated, and it's a lot faster. So Vara wide works when you're on a simplex frequency with another station capable of Vara wide. Uh, some people refer to this as 9600 baud, although it has nothing to do with packet 9600. It just means a wide bandwidth transmitter and receiver. But your radio has to be capable of doing that. Vara, the software, is capable only if your radio can do that. So again, a whole bunch of different. So each of these stations, NY3J, I know him, he sits on 145, six ton, uh, and almost 24 hours a day, you can connect to him and get a message through. So let's go back to 1990s. Uh, I bring up this slide because I had one of these. And in the 1990s, my son was 13 years old, newly licensed general, passed the code, passed the theory. He loved, you know, playing with dad's radios. And he said, Dad, I want one of these. I said, why? He said, because I can work keyboard mode and work the world. So, you know, we negotiated and we picked up one of these, hooked it up to a very simple ICOM 725 transceiver in the 1990s. That was about the simplest sideband radio you could get. He hooks it up for a Pactor 1. Not too difficult, but, you know, a little tricky. And I think the computer he used was an old Mac. <laughs> anyway, he gets on Pactor 1, 20 meters, 100-foot uh, cable out to our yard with a little wire antenna, you know, a, you know, a $5 20-meter wire antenna, ground plane on 20 meter, 17-foot tall, couple of radials. He has a ball. We work in the world on Pactor with, like, you know, 20 watts. I walk up in the shack one day, and he's talking to somebody. I said, who you got? And he said, oh, I've got this guy in Argentina. And they're speaking in English, though. I said, oh, wow, that's fantastic. So I'm looking at the print as it comes. And this guy is saying after his name, QTH radio, he says, uh, I'm a lieutenant colonel in the Argentine Air Force. This is in English, but, you know, through PACT or DDD. Uh, I'm a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, and I'm a test pilot, and I test, you know, F-27 jets or something, you know. This is the 1990s, so. And then he says, what do you do for a living? Turns it to back to my son, my son's transmit. He says, well, I'm 13 years old. I'm in the sixth grade. I don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up. <laughs> back to you. <laughs> you know, like that can only happen on a keyboard mode. The guy's talking to this little kid and, you know, like my son's grinning. And I'm looking at this as a father and thinking, oh, man, I want to see the other guy's face, you know. He's bragging about he's a test pilot, and my son says, well, I'm only in sixth grade or seventh grade, whatever it was. So anyway, uh, this was great because it could do RIDI, PACTOR, CW, AMTOR, all kinds of modes. And I think at the time, this cost maybe one to two hundred dollars, something like that. It was not cheap, but, uh, you know, pretty advanced technology for the 1990s. This actually had all the guts that did the communication. In the back, you could connect it to what we called back then a dumb terminal. You have to be of a certain age to know what that means. 
You didn't need a sophisticated computer. You just needed a terminal that could listen to the ASCII and, you know, put print on the screen. 8100, I'm sorry. That's where I live. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, Pactor developed these TNCs, <laughs> and that got better and better and better. They figured out how to make the software better, and they got up to Pactor 3. What happened was they decided instead of FSK modulation to use PSK. Eh, we don't have to get into the details, but uh, faster, more robust. Uh, but then the TNCs cost $1,000, $1,500, you know. So they got to be pretty expensive. I have this particular one that I picked up used. And in fact, where is it? Oh, I think it's in my closet right now. But anyway, I hooked it up to an old ICOM 706, not a very sophisticated radio. And I got on Pactor 3 and I talked to stations all over the world with about 25 watts and a vertical antenna in my backyard. Pactor is amazing. And Pactor 3 is pretty darn fast. So these things are called Pactor controllers. Uh, the company is in Germany, and they will not license this to other manufacturers. So if you want to do Pactor, you're stuck with a pretty expensive piece of hardware. Uh, here's a fancier one. I don't have to talk about the details, but uh, well over $1,000, I think. Pactor 3, it's like having a six-speed bike. <laughs> the software can gear up to a faster speed, send data faster, or if there's QRM or uh, noise, back up to a slower speed. So the only way I can describe this is the number of tones change, the, the code rates change, the kind of modulation changes. And you can hear this during the QSO. The software decides if it needs to go faster or slower and not the operator. I don't type on the keyboard, try your fastest mode, Pactor. It's, it'll do that automatically. And you can get up to about 3,600 bits per second. That's, that's a lot faster than I can talk. Here's what the spectrum looks like. I didn't do this on my setup. I pulled this off the internet. So it's about as wide as a human voice, you know, a little over two kilohertz. There's 18 carriers. Um, what does that mean? It's like having 18 tanks lined up on a hill. Each one's firing independently. <laughs> Maybe that's not a good example in today's news. But 18 <laughs> individual signals here. They're as about as close as you can get to their neighbors without interfering. Ah. That's what makes the software kind of tricky. How much information can you compress into two kilohertz? There's a lot of fascinating theory about that that I won't go into. So this starts at about 400 hertz and goes up to here about 2600. So yeah, it's a little over two kilohertz wide. If you listen to this, it's kind of a growly sound. It's not very fun to listen to that. But Pactor 3 is a very efficient way of using two kilohertz worth of bandwidth. Here's some new ones, Pactor 4, 1800 baud. Unfortunately, uh, the FCC won't permit this. The FCC and, I mean, American FCC says the maximum baud uh, is 300 on the HF bands. That's kind of a silly thing. It goes back, you know, 40 years. Uh, the ARRL and others have been trying to say, why don't you have a bandwidth restriction, uh, F, you know, uh, federal government, why, why do the baud restriction? So there's a little problem here, but they're legal on almost all else in the world. And in the back, you see there's a radio control, an audio control. Uh, there's all kinds of ways you can adjust this USB, you know, power in, you can do it on the internet. Uh, they're fantastic pieces of equipment. I do not have one. These are close to $2,000. Uh, I wouldn't spend $2,000 just to do Pactor 4. But maybe if I was a sailboat out in the Atlantic, I would want the best modem I could get, and you know I wouldn't be afraid to spend that much money on a really good uh, TNC. Pactor 4 speeds are really super. So the rates, if this is bits per second, here's Pactor 3, 3600. So you see, it can do essentially a whole lot faster than Pactor 3. Maybe one day there'll be a you know Pactor 5, 6, 8, who knows? But there's a, a sort of a limit to how much information you can cram into two or three kilohertz worth of space, Pactor 4. So the speed levels, one through 10. Hey, well, that's like having a 10 speed bike. If you have a lousy connection, the software you know, goes the other way, down to speed two or one. At one point I thought, well, where are these Pactor stations so I can get on the internet and check where are the Pactor 3 stations who are active right now? It's not that I want to contact all of them, I just want to see where they are. So look, I forget what time of day this was, but there's a lot in the U.S., Canada, a couple in South America, not many. You know, Europe, 
couple up here, a couple in Australia, <coughs> you know, all over the world, there's pack tour stations. And on 20 meters, you know, I could easily go a thousand miles to, you know, Europe, and they might from there, you know, transfer my information on the internet to anywhere in the world. So I don't need a neighbor to do pack tour. I just need somewhere else. Now, and what was it, the Puerto Rico, one of those big hurricane things, someone set up a uh, pack tour station with Winlink on, was it Puerto Rico? I think so. And uh, was able to contact someone up here in North America to get a lot of the information back and forth when all the internet and power lines and everything went down. All right, so let's ju jump to Vara. Uh, so Vara is created by EA5, H V, is it K? I just forgot, <laughs> HVK, uh, Jose, Spain. Uh, I've written to him a number of times, uh, email in English, and he responds back in English. Um, he's just very, very clever, and he has a team developing this, and it's just, it's a superb piece of software, so he doesn't want to give it away, so if you want it, you got to buy it. Um, I was surprised that Winlink, the organization, didn't buy it from him and give him, you know, a huge sum of money. So he hasn't done it that way. So maybe Winlink will eventually, you know, barter with Jose and those of us using Winlink won't need a separate uh, VAR license, but at the moment we do. So this is an old picture because VAR is up to version six now, but you get an ID here. There's a very cool window that I call the speedometer window. This is the modem window. It shows you how much input audio you're getting. It's just the loudness of the sound. This is not like an S meter on your radio. It's a sound meter. This is showing you how much CPU your computer is needed to do this. So on old computers, sometimes this gets up into the, hey, you're stretching my, my memory, my processor. Automatic frequency control on HF is telling you, well, my radio says this number and the radio I'm talking to says this number, but we don't agree. We're off by what? nine hertz well you know like who cares about nine hertz you know on voice you'd never notice on you know a change of nine hertz even on cw i doubt if most cw operators would mind if you go up or down nine hertz but vera does so vera has to be really within one hertz lined up with another vera signal for the for these uh for these tones to work and finally so how good is your signal to noise if it's up here 12 o'clock or higher that's a really good connection if it's down here into the noisy level, uh, not going to go very well. If it's in the red, forget it. Find another gateway. So this is fun. During the connections, I have the most fun just watching this. <laughs> it's sort of like watching the speedometer or the gearbox on your car. So there's a Vera interface, and uh, I hope to show you both of these. This is the interface of the sending station. This is the interface of the receiving station. Ah. So Stephen and I are going to try tonight to send some messages back to each other on an 80 meter frequency. We're not quite there yet, Stephen, but get get ready. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll show you a little bit how it works. Um, but let's talk about Vara HF on single sideband. It has two possibilities, and this is critical. You can select narrow, which limits the speeds on your bike, the gears, to speeds that are 500 hertz <clears throat> or less in bandwidth. That means play nice with your neighbor. Or eh, if the band's not uh, too busy and if you've got uh, a little more space, you can go to Vera wide as long as you both agree. And as long as the frequency you wanna use isn't in use by another digital mode. Now, all of these, by the way, are in the digital part of the bands. Um, none of these modes would work in the phone part of the band. That would be illegal and horrendous. But look at this. If I go to Vera HF 500, I've got, uh, what is this? 13 different speeds. 13 speeds from very, very painfully slow, 18 bits per second. I mean, you know, I can do CW faster than that. Uh, back up here to, uh, you know, 1500 bits per second. That's pretty fast. Vera HF. If I'm willing to go to the wide mode, 2300, about the same bandwidth as a human voice, then we can get a couple thousand, couple thousand bits per second. Uh, what does that mean, bits per second? It means one piece of information per second. So think about it as baud. It's, it's pretty close to that. How does the software do this? Well, it has a choice. It can increase the number of carriers. That's like the tanks on the hill. 
or it can increase the symbol rate, or both, or it could change the structure of the modulation. FSK is sort of like, you know, a packet, D, 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 RIDI. RIDI is FSK, D, 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 two tones. Um, I can go to BPSK, which is the famous BPSK31. It's a phase shift. I can go to multiple PSKs, and finally up here, 32 QAM. I hate to try to explain that, but it's a combination of phase shift and amplitude amplitude shift in like a two-dimensional it's like explaining three-dimensional chess to somebody that's really really fast um i think that's sort of like the modulation that's used in cell phones i'm not sure of that though um, but the faster you go the more information you know you can send per second vara hf here's vara fm now vara fm you've got an advantage there's more space <laughs> So I've got the full width of a human, you know, voice on a microphone or more. So the symbol rates for Vera FM go all the way up to 12,000 on the narrow mode and up to 25,000 on the wide mode. Now the wide is so wide it won't work on a repeater. Usually repeaters limit the bandwidth to about 3000 Hertz or a little more. So the bandwidth of Vera wide is uh, almost six kilohertz. That's pretty wide. That means your radio has to be capable of that kind of modulation. And the only two meter four four radios that can do that are the radios that used to be called 9600 baud packet compatible. This has nothing to do with packet, nothing. It's just that the 9600 means those kinds of radios can get audio in and out of the radio without restricting the bandwidth. So like a human voice, we don't, we don't do that. Any questions so far? I am, am I aiming too high or too low? No, you're good. Keep it going. Okay. <laughs> so if I were to show you my receive window while someone's sending me a uh, Winlake message with VARA, uh, and here it's VARA FM, this is sort of what it looks like. And I think this was maybe one message. Oh, yeah. See, at the bottom, I see who's talking to who. K3EUI was sending a message to K3EUI. Whoops. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's me to me. That's... Sounds like incest. Um, I had two radios. They were both on two meters, on two antennas, on two computers. I had both radios tuned to like, you know, one watt so then burn each other out. And the two antennas were out in my yard about 30 feet apart. Anyway, I got fantastic rates. Why? Well, because, you know, the RF only went 20 feet. So look at this. The signal to noise topped out 30, 30 dB. It's, you know, it's like one computer was talking directly to the other computer. The fastest modes show up as a lot more squares here. This is fun to watch. This is called the constellation. Depending on what gear you're in or level, this was gear 11, 12,750 bits per second. That's the fastest that Vera narrow here says Vera. That's the fastest mode possible. Well, I would expect to because my signal to noise was over 30 dB. I mean, when's the last time you talked to someone with any digital mode and the signal to noise ratio was plus 30 dB? On HF, I'm used to signals that are minus 5 dB, minus 10 dB, you know, not in the, in the plus range. This shows the BPS as I'm receiving each block. So Winlink sends transmission, and then says, did you get it? Yeah. Transmission of data. Did you get it? Yeah. And it keeps going back and forth. But if the receiving says, no, 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 didn't get it, send it again, the sending station sends the same bucket of data again and again and again until the receiving station says, yeah, 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 I got it. Send the next bucket. So you can see here, I didn't miss any buckets. <laughs> well, I wouldn't expect it. And this shows you on the vertical, the speed, BPS. The horizontal is time. I think they're every bucket. And the buckets were like uh, two, three, four seconds worth of data. So this is really fun to watch. Down here, it's telling you what's happening. You're sending the data. You're acknowledging someone else's. A NAC means, nope, didn't get it. NAC, nope, NAC. Uh, request for a resend, idle, break. QRT is really bad. It means give it up, stop. <laughs> you know. so, um, so I sent myself a file that was 140 kilobytes in size. That would be, uh, no, the file I sent was, I was going to say no, 55 kilobytes. But sending it to myself just on two two-meter radios, I sent a 55 kilobyte file. The time here, can you see where I'm pointing? I can't. The time yeah. is 23 seconds. It's like, that's nothing. 
a 50 kilobyte file in 20 seconds. It's like, yikes, how did that, you know, that's really fast. So the rate is going at, uh, you know, 140,000 kilobytes per minute. So you can either quote the speed in bytes per minute or kilobytes per minute or bits per second as the data is coming through. Either way, this is fast. So what do I need to do this? Let me show you some hardware and then we'll do a live example, I hope, if we're lucky here, if 80 meters is still good. So what do I need? Obviously I need a radio. It could be an HF radio or you know an FM radio. Uh, for transmit, what do I need? Well, I need a data port for the transmit audio. Well, every radio has a microphone, so I can get the sound card to go right into the microphone if I wanted to do it that way. But most radios have a data port these days, the newer radios especially. I've got to get receive audio. Where does that come from? Well, that's the radio speaker jack, headphone jack, or a data jack. So I've got to get the transmit and receive audio from my radio into my sound card. Then the sound card talks to the computer. In fact, I could probably use the sound card in my computer, but I'd rather not do that because every once in a while, my, my Windows machines makes weird sounds or chimes or I hear, you've got mail. I don't want that going over you know, 20 meters. So what's the sound card? Well, the sound card, that's the key to make this work, but it's not very expensive. As I pointed out, this little guy works pretty well. It's not my preferred sound card, but I tried it and it works. A whole bunch of different sound cards. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'd say within 10 feet of my right now are uh, seven, eight, nine different sound cards. I like to play with them. Uh, a lot of people give them to me and say, I can't get it to work. And I get it to work. I said, do you want it back? They said, now keep it. So I've got like five signal links, about eight rig blasters, a couple of DRAs. Uh, and some of the new radios have the sound cards built in. They're really nice. So the sound card technology, what do we need? It's an analog to digital converter. That's the key. Inside a sound card is a little tiny chip. Probably says Texas Instrument. Or now, if you're lucky, it says C Media there in Taiwan. That converts the data from the computer, which is a digital stream of data, to analog, digital to analog. That goes to your transmit. The data coming from your receiver headphone or speaker jack, that's analog audio. Dee -dee 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 -dee. That's analog. It gets into your sound card and into the mic input, and then the sound card converts that to zeros and ones and goes out over into uh, your, your computer as digital signal. And I'll show you what that means. So in a sense, our radios only see the analog audio. Our computers only deal with the digital side. That's what makes this kind of digital modes, but it's not digital sound, it's analog sound, where it's digital converted to analog and you know, so many bits per second. Uh, we need a way to make the radio transmit. So we need a COM port or a VOX port or something. When I say to Winlink transmit, it needs to talk to my radio and make it transmit. And all these have, you know, a common ground line. So that's the, that's the problem. We need to get the proper levels of audio. Not too loud, not too soft, not too distorted either. Avoid RF feedback. Well, <laughs> anyone who's played with digital modes can tell you if you get feedback, it's awful to figure out where is it coming from, how to cure it. Sometimes I found I got feedback on my keyboard USB cable. It's like, yikes because my computer would freeze. Just, I couldn't do anything. And I looked and I thought, maybe I'm getting RF into my computer by the keyboard cable. So I put some toroids on that and cured it. How about your mouse cable? Well, I've got some 10, 20 year old mice. You know, Maybe I should put toroids. You know, you want to RF proof everything. Optional rig control. This makes it really slick, but it's not essential. So let me show you an example of my all band, all mode, all everything radio. Uh, and it's actually not my radio. It belongs to the Chester County Aries Races organization. But I had it set up in my house because I was the station manager. And I had to learn how to uh, operate it and repair some of the equipment, set it up, and train other operators. So here's an old ICOM 706 Mark IIG. You know, they were very popular 20 years ago. Man, that was like my 1970 Chevy half-ton pickup truck. Three speeds on the column. It would go anywhere. It went up Pikes Peak. It didn't do it very fast, but I got up to the top of Pikes Peak. Wow. Uh, this radio is not spectacular at anything, but it does almost everything. All bands, two meter, 440, uh, AM, FM, 
ready. It does everything. Uh, and it's a little box. There's no antenna tuner. My antenna tuner is over here. Little sloppy MFJ HF antenna tuner. But attached to this on the back of one port is a Pactor TNC. So this little gadget uh, owned by the county was picked up from a sailboat company, or no, I think it was a freight company that had like a hundred of these and they wanted to upgrade. So they sold them at very, very reduced price. So our county uh, bought like 20 of these things and we converted them to you know amateur radio use. Uh, it has the name C-Wave because of the company. But it's a Pactor TNC, really slick. Has some nice, pretty lights up here that light up and show you when you're tuned in. Here's an ordinary signal link. Many of you probably have seen these. This is good for Vara. This is good for Packet and Pactor. This thing is just very, very simple technology. There's you know probably 10,000 of them or 100,000 out, out there. Uh, I'll show you what the inside looks like. Very, very simple stuff. Here's one of my favorites. It's a Rig Blaster Advantage. Advantage sounds good, doesn't it? But in this is the sound card and a COM port. And the COM port can be used for cat control and other things as well. So it has transmit, receive, and a delay here. My microphone plugs into here. So if I pick up a mic and push the button, this thing cuts off the sound card. So it's kind of an intelligent sound card and it can do almost anything that any sound card can do. And it does it well. What's the problem? Well, it's about 200 bucks. So it's about twice the price of a signal. Signal links don't have COM ports. They're just audio codecs. Here's an old rig blaster. This goes back to like hmm, probably 20 years ago. I hooked this up to a data jack in the back of this is an ICOM 2100. So we're talking about 2000, year 2000 technology. This works by injecting the audio into the mic jack. It works. Where does it get received audio from? In the back, the speaker jack, the headphone jack. And this thing would work just as well as any sound uh, device. They're very, very simple. You can find them now at Hamfest for like $10, $20. And if they're not all beat up, I often pick them up and fix them up and give them away. So here's the generic what it looks like. You have a computer. Well, this is, you know, a blotchy computer. But here you connect a USB cable to your USB sound card, which I'm just showing as a signal link. So there's two things happening here. Receive and transmit audio is get going back and forth as a digital signal. And there's a ground and there's a plus five volt bus line. The five volts runs the signal link. So you don't have to plug the signal link into a separate power supply. That has some advantages and some disadvantages. The signal link connects to the radio on a different cable called obviously the radio cable. This is analog audio going back and forth here. It'd almost be the same if I could pick up a microphone and whistle Riddy or whistle Vara. It doesn't make any difference. This can go into the mic jack or a data jack. You don't need one of these if your radio has a built-in sound card. <laughs> That's a great advantage. But uh, the advantage of this is the push to talk is simple. As soon as audio comes through, it trips the Vox uh, connection in the signal link. If you've ever operated voice by Vox, you know, as soon as you talk, your radio goes on the air. When you stop talking, you go back to receive. That's how this works. So this little DLY delay knob, that's like the hang time. How long do you want to wait before your signal link lets you go back to receive mode? And for something like VAR and WinLink, you have to set this like for a tenth of a second or less, 100 milliseconds. Here's a blow up of the signal link. Um, kind of pretty. You've got an on light, a PTT light, transmit and receive level controls. A lot of people get these and they just love them because, it, again, it's like a Chevy pickup truck, you can't, you can't beat it up too badly. Here's what the back looks like. The USB is the computer connection. The radio is an RJ45, but the other end of the cable is whatever fits your radio. There's a monitor jack if you wanna to listen to your transmit audio on headphones. And there's a speaker and an auxiliary jack if you wanna pull off audio from even a scanner or something else, receive audio. Here's what the inside looks like. Uh, I only wanted to show you this because here's the key. Every radio has different connections, data ports, mic chin, pins. So inside the signal itself, if you open it up, there's this jumper block here. It says speaker. Which of these pins, here's eight pins, RJ45. Which pin is the speaker? So you put a wire from one to two, speaker to two, mic to one, PTT to three, you know, in a grand connect. You wire this up for your particular radio. 
and the cable has to go to your particular radio. Once you get it wired, you're done. If you change radios, you may have trouble because this needs to be reconfigured or you may need a different cable. But that's basically what it is. The other thing, here's the TI chip, um, mono only. It's only a left channel. They didn't bother to wire up the right channel for anything. Makes it a little cheaper. Here's the knobs, transmit, receive, level on a couple of pots. It's not a very exotic circuit. Um, I wrote to Signalink uh, because I wanted to modify this in some ways. And I said, uh, I want to change a couple of things here. Can you send me the schematic? And the engineer who wrote back to me said, no. I said, you know, all I want is the schematic for an ordinary signal link. He said, we don't share that. It's, uh, what do they call it? Uh, privilege, priority. Uh, proprietary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I can open it up and see all the parts, but they won't show me the schematic. Well, I guess that's their choice. Um, anyway. So if you look at the inside, here's like a sample. If you get these wires, you can do that. Uh, people used to mess this up. So Tigertronics, the manufacturer of signal links, finally said, let's just make jumper blocks you plug in. So they started to put these together. And each jumper block is wired for a specific radio. At the, at the uh, radio end, you might have jacks that look like this or look like this, you know. Here's one of my favorites, <laughs> you know, $10. <laughs> It's a beautiful little, you know, simple plug-in USB, has a headphone jack and a mic jack. Also has volume controls and <laughs> mutes. <laughs> Not that I need those, but a complete sound card for 10 bucks. It works as well as the signal link. Wow. And if you really, really get stuck and you can't get it to transmit, here's a very simple circuit to when your transmitter needs to transmit, your computer says, okay, let's use a dumb COM port. What do I mean by dumb? This is not cat control, it's not rig control. So the serial port on your computer or a USB to serial cable sends a positive voltage on either the RTS or the DTR pin. If you don't know what that means, it's just two wires on a standard uh, COM port. They turn, the computer turns this into plus 12 volts rather than zero. The plus 12 volts comes through here, through here, into the base. It makes this thing uh, wildly amplify, conduct. And your PTT wire, like from your microphone circuit, goes to ground. You know, you could build this for five bucks. The PTT has got to go to your radio's PTT circuit, like the equivalent of the push to talk on the microphone or in the data jack. This is very secure. It just means you need to use a COM port for that, but that's no big deal. And let me stop with this. Well, if you have one of these radios, you don't worry about all this junk. You know, uh, I know a lot of my friends have this uh, Yezu FT991A, and either they love it or <laughs> or not, because it looks like it's just gorgeously built, and it is, but it's got a menu system that only Yezu engineers could put together. There's like 150 menus numbered, and they're all kind of intertwined. I'm hearing activity on our frequency. Is that you, Stephen? No, I'm hearing, I'm hearing someone on... 3560, we may have to move. No, oh, it's me. Sorry. Who is that? Ted, don't transmit on 3560, please. You'll mess us up. Okay. I was I was trying to hit, see if I could hit you. That's no, awesome. no, no, no. That'll completely mess me up. Because I don't okay. yeah. Thank you for the offer, but no. <laughs> okay, I don't want to even talk about FL Digi. That's a whole nother thing. All right. So let me close this. Let me see. I don't want to close something I want. And let me bring up. Screen sharing has stopped. Oh, how did I do that? Okay, I got to go back to screen share. Okay, I think now I got to put my Vera windows back up here. Okay, do you guys see what I see here? I got three wind link windows. No, we only see your Vera window. Oh, man, no. Who's connected to me? K3RTA. <laughs> see, while I wasn't, see, while, while I wasn't paying attention, K3RTA linked to me. Bad Ted, bad Ted. Very bad Ted, he did that without asking. Very nice. You know, it does show you something. If I've got my equipment running, I can go take a hike <laughs> and my equipment will, you know, will work. Yeah, see, that was K3EUI identifying. All right, so 
All right. Uh, well, that was kind of interesting, wasn't it? He connected to me, and I didn't even know until when I opened my screen. I thought, "Why am I seeing a uh, you know file go by?" All right, Ted. <laughs> All right. So let me show you what I've got. Here's my Vera window. Thirty-five sixty. I'm hearing something on it. So I'm going to go to what's called settings and sound card and just check if my radio will transmit about 50 watts. So I hit the tune button and you guys can hear the sound that's coming through my Zoom microphone. And Stephen, do you see my signal on 3560 VFO? And he's nodding yes. Yes, I do see it. All right, so can Stephen, send me a tune and folks can hear what I hear. Just a tune, not a connect yet. All right, stand by. So we're both on an 80 meter frequency. And we're what, uh, a couple dozens of miles apart, maybe more. There it is. So leave it on there for a minute. Leave it on, leave it on. So he's hitting me about an S8 or so. And what are you like, under 50 watts, Stephen? 46. Yeah, OK, yes. so I'm at about 50 watts, too. So this doesn't take a whole lot of power. My antenna is a 100 foot wire in a tree and Stephen's running a long wire too of some sort. So what we're going to do is you're going to watch my screen because I'm sharing it, right? Stephen is going to be the initiator. He's going to connect to me, K3EUI, on peer to peer. If he has an email that's already set up in his up here outbox, if he has an email addressed to K3EUI, once we get together and do some handshaking, hello, here are you, blah, 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 blah. He's going to say to me, well, to my Vera, I've got an email for you. Are you ready? And I'm going to politely say, yeah, send it to me. And while I'm getting his email, you're going to see my screen filled with data. If it works. <laughs> if I get his email completely, I'll send a response back that says, got it. By the way, I've got two emails for you. Stephen didn't even know that. So I'm going to send Stephen two emails, and you're going to watch my Vera window while I'm sending data. So before we start, I give this a 50-50 chance at best, because we're on a noisy band right now. Uh, my noise level is about S7 with nothing. Uh, so I hope this works. So Stephen's call is KC3, uh, KC3DSO. And what he does is initiate a contact by up here in this window, he'll write K3EUI. He's going to send me a message. By, just, by the just, way, just, you're you're only sharing your Vara yeah, window. Yeah, Barry. You, you, yeah, you need to share the whole screen, not just the Vara window. Oh, thank you for telling me that. That's bad. I, I want to share the whole screen. Know. All right, did this work? You see much all three better. windows. Oh, much better. Yep. Oh, wow. I'm glad you mentioned that. Or I, See, I was assuming I'm sharing. Yeah, I see what I did. I shared one window. So you should see three windows, correct? Yep. Yes. Okay. Not I'm going to put this in the center. This is the one I want you to concentrate on. Right here, I see some color in a waterfall, and I see two red lines. The red lines tells me my very signal at Stevens is going to take up this much space. So my filter on my sideband radio has to be at least... I would say two and a half, three kilohertz wide. I can't use a narrow filter where this mode won't work. I also want to be sure no one else is on this frequency, right? <laughs> I don't hear anybody. This is usually a part of the band that's reserved for CW. So we're not going to uh, be on this too long. But when I listened up on the windling part of the band, it was like filled with stations. So Stephen is going to do the connect to K3EUI, and you should hear both his audio here on, I don't want to show you, I've got a little speaker, and when I transmit, I have my monitor on, and you should hear my, so you should hear the two sounds back and forth. If you can also watch Stephen's window at the same time, it would be really cool, but we can't do that on Zoom. So Stephen, give it a go. Okay. I'm going to turn up the sound. That was fast. Now what it's for it's forcing five hundred because I'm set at five hundred. Oh, do you want to? You, you were you set. You, you were at twenty three hundred. 
If you want to stop and reconnect, you'll go much faster. Let's stop. Okay, let me abort. Yeah. So in other words, if Stephen limited us to 500 hertz, I thought this you would do. Our, I thought what you said earlier to do. No problem. I'll, I'll only change it. when we were up in the busy part of the band. There's no one near us here. All right, give me so a second. We're going to go for gold. We're going to go for the widest, fastest we can. Because that will impress you all. <laughs> and plus, I don't hear any CW stations in the region. So he did a mechanical abort, abort, and we broke the link. Okay, it's got to restart because I changed it here. Okay. Okay. And everyone else, you, you might want to mute your audio so we don't interfere with each other. Okay. Yes. Yes. Now you're muted, Ted. Yeah, just yeah. on the lid from before, just to let you know, when I did that, I was on 16 watts on a 58 foot uh, long wire, 20 feet off the ground. Oh, well, I heard you because we were connected. So, yeah, <laughs> it, it really doesn't pick up. Yeah, okay. You all set, Barry? I'm um, yes, hands up. Okay, I'm not gonna touch up. it. <laughs> That's funny. It'll work. Bingo, we're connected. Now look at this button, AFC. Let's see what let's see what this ends up being. It's probably too loud at my end. He's sending. So we're handshaking right now. We're negotiating. Look at that. Our modems were 0.6 hertz off. I mean, give us a break. Here comes his data. BPS. Okay, let's see what speeds we get here. Here it comes. Signal to noise only plus three, plus 0.3. So it's a mediocre connection. But let's see what the speeds are. Three simultaneous paths on one channel. You can't beat that with a stick. Oh, wait a minute. The message just stopped. What happened? What happened? Okay, mine sent, but I did not receive yours. Were they formatted as peer to peer? Yes, two of them. Oh, let me check. Oh, I, it was so fast. I thought, I thought, I thought we disconnected. I have a message in my inbox. So, all right, <laughs> I got a message from KC3 DSO. Let yeah, me open it. I did not get yours right. though. If you were saying. Yeah. Them. Okay. Well. I, all right. So at least this worked. So here's message from, from uh, KC3 DSO. Can you read this? Peer well, that's right. You're not in Delaware. You're Testing. in Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, I'm Pennsylvania. On the I'm, I'm the first Commonwealth, not the first. <laughs> All right. Testing P2P to Barry in Delaware. So I still accepted it. <laughs> so that was a pretty brief message. Now, why didn't I? I've got two messages for you. Oh, I know why. Ah, they're, I addressed them to myself. Yes, that's oh, not right, going to work, Barry. No, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. So, sorry. Yeah. Rookie error. Rookie error. All right. KC3. Uh, uh, what's your call again? DSO? D yeah, DSO. Wait, wait, wait. Don't do anything. Who's transmitting? Don't. I'm not. Someone's on here. Don't do it. Please stop, stop, stop. Who's Pretty transmitting much. on my frequency? Come on. Get off there. None of you guys should be transmitting. Or we're going to get, my grandma would say, for blunge it. Next up. All right, so I did a rookie error. I originally set this up to send the message to myself because I have another HF rig on a uh, uh, dummy load here. But once I found out Stephen get on 80 meters, I thought, oh, let's try that. So let me try something. I don't know why it didn't work before. I'm going to try to connect to Stephen. I'll be the instigator. So let me try to connect and see what happens here. Here's my polite request. We're connected. This time it worked. So watch my window here. We are connected. So this is telling me the quality of the signal probably too loud isn't it the diddly diddly is still handshaking there's no data yet now i have two emails ready to go and nothing's happening no it's because i have to check the okay to download box oh i never checked that okay so you manually have to do that i always right. i always do that why 
you know, the worst thing you want to do is an MCOM environment is downloading a bunch of crap you don't want. Oh, we don't we don't do that in Pennsylvania. <laughs> All right, now look at the numbers here. Look at the numbers. Look at the numbers. I'm up to 2682. That's fast for HF. Almost 3,000, and I slowed down to 2,000. So look at this, and look at my message. This green bar says I've almost sent it. Now, now, Steve has no idea what I'm sending. It's just a message. I'm slowing down to 500. Oh, that's awful. Oh, come on, Steve, get with it. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> We're slowing down. I've almost sent the message. All right, it's sent. It's sent. And I should just get an acknowledge from Steve that he just got it. Now, here's a second message. And what I'm sending Steve right now, if he gets it, will be interesting if he can open it. It's an American Red Cross daily shelter report. Um, are we disconnected? No, 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 no. It's okay. good. Okay. It's, good. it's good. It's good. It's good. All right, now this is a longer message. This is 20 kilobytes, so we'll see what happens. I can hear the sound. Do you guys hear the sound? And if you look at the waterfall, this is like a six, six carriers here. No, it's not as fast as I would have hoped. Look, we're down to a couple hundred BPS. That's slow. And the message is 20 kilobytes, and I'm just barely moving. So I might stop this, Steve. All right, just let it go. Let's see what it does. I might pick right. it up. You can talk while it's running if you want. Yeah, so I have the sound up. You guys don't need to hear that. So while we're exchanging uh, data here, do, does anyone have a question? Because my Zoom mic is always live. So what's the throughput of that message? We don't know till it finishes. <laughs> That's a good question. So it looks like uh, which shows the first nothing, message nothing. in your window there. Oh, the first message was about uh, four thousand bytes per second uh, per minute. That's not very fast on HF standards, but then again, we're on eighty meters on a noisy, you know, fifty watts. Uh, you know. Now uh, look on this window in the middle. As I'm sending the data, this green bar is going across, and it won't finish until the green bar gets to the far end. So I said about what 20% of my message and it's already taken a minute. So I'm going to stop it. I'm going to hit abort because there's no reason to let this go. I'm going to be polite and hit stop. Stop says to Steve, let's give up for a minute. We're just going to, here's our disconnect. Now notice in the end, uh, both of our stations identified in CW. How come? requirement yeah so uh if anyone else is listening on our frequency 3560 our frequency see see steve it's now our frequency if anyone else is listening they have no idea what we're sending they can't decode our transmissions that's kind of strange isn't it Winlink has been criticized for that steve and i are understanding back and forth as we're sending the data but I'm not reading the data. The data is going into you know, my computer. And if I get it all, then I can read it. <clears throat> so unlike some of the other modes, for instance, if I was on FL Digi and sending with you know, Thor, Olivia, MFSK, anyone in the world who is listening to that sound can see the message as it's coming across. Winlink is really one-to-one. -one, and it's not that it's encrypted, but no one else can decode it. Well, there are people who can decode it, who can decode binary. I'm sure I'll have no problem with that. Yeah, so here's the deal. All the messages that go through gateways get recorded on the gateway computer system and they're stored. The gateway operators, they're responsible for any message that goes through their gateway. So they have the ability to read it all. And every once in a while, one of my friends who's a local gateway operator says, it's not that someone's sending a commercial message, but someone sending, you know, junk and he, re, you know, writes back and says, you don't need to use a valuable 20 meter frequency to send, you know, a 20 kilobyte picture of your cat, you know, because people like to play. Let me close this. Steve, anything else? Couldn't that you... it just be recorded and played back? Yeah. You want to play back binary? You still won't understand it. 
Yeah, Windlink, Windlink uses a, a B2F compression protocol that you're not going to be able to view. Right. Now, you got to keep in mind that the, on the windlink.org site, anyone with an FCC call sign that registers on windlink.org can view every message sent through the common mail service, the CMS, which is now Amazon Web Services. So anybody can read any message. So you got to keep that in mind with everything you send through a gateway or a node. If it's going through the, if it's entering the internet, if it's entering CMS, the Amazon Web Services, it can be read by any ham. But what we did tonight was peer to peer. That was private. That's correct. But there is what a difference. What we did is not on the internet. Well, there's a caveat to that too. If the laptops, either one of the laptops or computers that we're using, and we have marked that we are to get an email notification, it now goes through the CMS because that's the only way it will send a notification. You got to take your laptops. You got to take them off the internet. And not have that come up. Oh, I didn't I, know that. It's That's absolutely true. So if you have it set that you want to email that you got a message, you know, you want to send to a Gmail address or you got something up, that's the only way it can. It's got to go through the server. It's, okay, there's no it. other way it can work. But if you're right, if you have a peer-to-peer -peer message and you don't have any internet connection, it's going to be just you two, the sender and receiver, the two client stations. That's correct. Yeah, if you that's, knew the call sign that it was coming from, couldn't you replay? If you recorded the uh, the audio, couldn't you replay it back through? No, your because see, you no that that wouldn't work either. Uh, yeah. It's continually changing speeds, changing <laughs> frequencies. In other words, we're talking to each other, and the, the you know the radios are doing this. <laughs> I got you. Um, but you're allowed to by FCC regulation, you should be able to capture those that transmission and be able to play it back if you wish to. You can play it back. You just won't convert it to English. Mm, okay. <laughs> it's not encrypted. If that's no, it's not, definitely that's not, not encrypted. encrypted. Nothing should be encrypted on. It's over, not. Over no, it's, it's just not. compression. It's, it's compression. Just, yeah. So in Chester County, most of our emergency communication work is done this way. Um, let's say we we have and we just had a limerick. Uh, nuclear generating plant drill. Um, what happens is the EOC in the county, it's just down the street from me here on West Town Road, uh, there's a ham radio station adjacent to the 911 room. So if an emergency message comes, say, from the governor's office to the county, and they get it, however they get it, they forward that message to the W3 EOC ham radio group. They look at that, and depending on how they get it, they convert that into a form that can send by radio. Usually the form is an FL Digi form. It's a message compressed, but put into an FL Digi rather than Winlink. W3EOC's radio will send that out on two meters or 440, just an FM radio. But 20 of us stationed all over the county in different townships are listening to that at the same time on FL Digi, NBEMS it's called. And our computers are translating that back into the original message from the governor. Once I get it, if I get it, I can put it in my browser, print it, rip it off, hand it to the EOC manager at my township building, might be a police chief, fire chief, you know, somebody, and say, here's a message that came five minutes ago from the governor's office. That's the way we do most of our work rather than using WinLink, because WinLink would be good one-to-one -one but most of our emergency communication is one, the, the county, out to 20 townships at once. So we as hams are in the individual townships. So we have to bring our own equipment, our own computer. Many of us also bring our own battery. You know, for, so at the last Limerick drill, I was stationed at a place where, um, I guess it was two, two years ago, I was at Charleston uh, Township Building, and we had someone there from Pima and someone from FEMA and then the ordinary staff of the people in there. And I was getting messages on a two meter uh, frequency, handing, you know, printing them, handing them out. And the FEMA and the PEMA guys were very impressed because often I got the message before the county township, I mean, the township uh, managers got it on their own fax machine. So they were kind of wondering why was our system faster than the normal, you know, fax machines? I, I don't know. I said, I looked at the fax machine. Is it plugged in? You know, like, so they weren't getting anything. So the guy looked at me. Oh, who's screen sharing? Uh, I am just to show that I got your document. Oh, oh, good, good, good. So here, see, we weren't kidding. So I sent 
a American Red Cross sample drill message. Probably at the bottom, I should have said this is a drill message. Yeah. This is a test, very blah, blah, blah. And, you know, January 16th. So it's an old one I just pulled up. But these are the kind of messages we sent. Yeah, thank you for that. So uh, the FEMA and the Pima guys were both pretty impressed because I was sitting off on the side at a two meter uh, five eighths antenna mag mount on a filing cabinet, you know, Kirk Plunk on a metal filing cabinet. My radio was a little, I cut, you know, nothing special. But I also brought a pretty good size gel cell marine battery. And so the guy was from Pima, especially was pretty impressed. And he looks at me, he says, I'm impressed with what you're you can do. I said, well, thank you. We practice doing this. He said, but what if you lost AC power? I see you're plugged into a power supply and it's plugged into the wall. What would you do if we lost power in the building? I said, well, tell you what, pull the plug out and let's see. So he pulls the plug out. You know, he thought my radios would go dead. And I had one of these little ISO, you know, it switched over to my battery and nothing changed. He looks, he says, oh, so you can operate this radio on a battery. I said, yeah, and you know, the battery that I brought is probably good for about, I don't know, eight or 10 hours maybe, but I've got two or three more batteries in the car if I needed them. Plus I could pull your battery out of your car if I needed that, I just need 12 volts. And he looked at me, he said, now I'm impressed. <laughs> so I thought, well, we got some points out of that one. Hey, Barry, yes. I really appreciate all the time you spent with us. We need to have you come back and talk to us more on emergency calm and, and your experience up there in chester county can we do that another night with you well i would talk about fl digi i mean i was sort of told <laughs> you and john do vara and vara is cool <laughs> well let, let's let's get you back we have to move on to our regular meeting okay um so chat and i will talk to you offline and see about getting you back for some other stuff okay okay and i see it, it's closing in on nine o'clock and up here in chester county pennsylvania we call nine o'clock quaker midnight so that's... Well, I, was, I was gonna say we're gonna all start turning into little pumpkins here a little bit so yeah i i i, I hate to cut you off but we really that's fine <laughs> i've enjoyed this i could talk about this for three days but yes I, have and, a good and I meeting listen to you for three days so this, this is good. <laughs>